kindergarten and first grade, Miss Kathy here. We're ready to read our Pilgrim Stories. And you see I have some tabs marked now so that I know how far we've got to go. If we want to finish all the pages that I put into your blue folder, we've got some listening to do. Mine's black, remember that, but yours is blue. Um, the last we did, uh, <clears throat> we were writing about the Pilgrims uh, in Holland. And they had, they just, uh, our last sentence was, the Pilgrims seek refuge in Holland. So today, I think it's just going to be a listening day because your next picture is this, oops, the Pilgrim's Voyage on the Mayflower. And I think you have another one in yours that looks like, hang on, sorry, sorry. When I put them in my notebook, I didn't put them in the same order that you had them in yours, which was really silly. Not sure why I didn't do that. <clears throat> so you have a page that looks like this. The Pilgrims, like a title page. The Pilgrims route from England to the New World. Okay, so right now they're in Holland. So we have to find out what happens to them in Holland. So we're not going to be writing anything today. So you don't need your folder. Just listen. And I know some of you... Um, these are kind of long chapters, and so it's not it's not as fun as um, Lee Ferrickson and Pocahontas and even Robinson Crusoe and Jamestown, but you can pause it if you get tired of it and come back to it. So we've got a few chapters to read uh, before we get to our next writing part. Okay, let me open the book to make sure that I'm in the right place. Hang on. Yes, okay. We stopped last. Um, on page 53 or whatever of my old book, but I got Miss Dee Dee's newer book. It's just a little different and we're gonna, I'm gonna be able to follow the pages correctly. All right. I'm turning to page 55. Look at how much we've already read of this, of this, of this book. We've already read that much. That's a lot. And you know what? I want to tell you a little bit about this author, Margaret Pumphrey. Do you know who she was? She was a school teacher in the early 1900s. So what year is it now? It's 2000. 20. Yes. So over 120 years ago, or about 100 and maybe 10 years ago, um, she compiled these stories for her students in order to enlarge upon their interest in the lives of the first pilgrim settlers in America. It is indeed a colorful saga with all the intrigue, danger, and adventure of one of the most memorable stories of all time. Pumphrey's delightful retellings are based upon the historical accounts recorded in both William Bradford's, his book he wrote, of Plymouth Plantation, and Edward Winslow's book called Good News from New England. So, um, she actually took, looked at the people who lived then, William Bradford, we've read about him, and another person, we haven't talked about him yet, Edward Winslow, and they really lived during that time, and they made, they wrote their story down. So she looked at original source documents, that's what it's called, to be able to retell us the story. Um, <clears throat> then she wrote this, the additions I have made are taken for a number of his, oh, no, sorry. The <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the person who took Ms. Pumphrey's work. This is Ray Berg, um, who is, in 2009, she took the original Pilgrim stories by Marguerite Pumphrey and added a little bit of information to them. Just like my book, Stories of the Pilgrims, got added information by um, Michael McHugh. So they're very similar. 
They just have a little bit different information in them. Okay, so she said she included um, the lovely horizontal history of Genevieve Foster, the world of Captain John Smith and Chief of the Pilgrims, the life and time of William Brewster by Reverend Ashbel Steele. So, she used some other original source stories. Um, let's see. Hang on. Like Billington Boys near blowing up the Mayflower. Okay, then it tells... Um, Sorry, I'm kind of reading the preface, but I'm just telling you the information out of it. It says, the story of Queen Anne visiting the Scrooby Manor is authenticated, that means proved, in her later title and the other tales of adventure and misadventure, like the Billington boys nearly blowing up the Mayflower, are all true and authenticated or proven true by numerous sources. In other words, <clears throat> if more than one person in history tells the same story, they pretty much, historians pretty much say, okay, that's gotta be true. Because especially if they were totally different people, not in the same family, not related, and they, um, they are telling the same story of what happened in that account, even though they aren't, weren't necessarily together, or I guess they had to be together to experience it. Anyway, okay. Um, enough of that. Let's get on to the home in Amsterdam. The pilgrims soon found the street where their new homes were, but how different it was from the streets of Scrooby. Down the middle of it was a broad stream of water called a canal. On each side of the canal was a narrow road paved with stones. The roads were not wide enough for a horse and wagon. When the people wished to ride or had heavy loads to carry, they used a boat on the canal. The houses looked more odd than the street. They were made of brick and ev of every shade of red and pink and yellow. They stood close to the street and quite near together. But strangest of all, many of them did not stand straight. This is because they were not built upon walls of stone as ours are. Um, even here in the United States, we have a footer around our house usually that's cement. And then we build with bricks on top of that. Or some people's houses are made out of wood, but it's built on top of a foundation. Plus, we have rock and stone here in Waco in Texas. Um, <clears throat> and that's why nobody here has basements too much because it's really hard to dig down in there. But up in the north, they always have basements because it helps keep their... Um, pipes from freezing in the winter and they can go down in the basement and store things and and it um they it and if they have to they can get down in the basement and stay warm near the the furnace things like that anyway so that was a big difference let's find out what it's built on mm -hmm. these homes were built upon great posts driven deep into the earth in holland the ground is often soft and wet the weight of the house often makes the posts sink in deeper on one side than the other, and the house tends to lean to one side. When William Bradford reached the house he had taken for his friends, he unlocked the front door with a huge brass key. Then the Brewster stepped into the hall, or the parlor, do you suppose? No, they were in the kitchen, for that is the front door in a Dutch house. The sitting room looks out on the pretty garden behind the house. But the kitchen is off in the dining room and sitting room too. Where does your front door open into? Does it open into your kitchen? No, maybe you have a back door that opens into my kitchen. I have a back door that opens into my kitchen. But my front door opens right into kind of a little entryway. And then you can take a left to go into our living room. Um, a lot of people's homes, we don't, I can't think of anyone I know in the United States whose home opens into the kitchen. The front door opens into the kitchen, but in a Dutch house, that's how it is. The sitting room, okay, we already said that. <clears throat> At night, it is very likely to be a bedroom as well, though you would never think it until you saw the quaint box-like bed drawn from its hiding place in the wall. Oh, it was talking about the kitchen being a sitting room. That's basically a living room or a place where people sit around and talk. 
So they're also saying the bedrooms could be that too. In this kitchen, the floor was made of tiles. There were fresh white curtains in the little windows and a row of blossoming plants on one of the window sills. A long shelf held a row of plates, a blue and white water pitcher, and two tall candles. There were the oddest there was the oddest little fireplace in the room. It looked like a great brass pan filled with hot coals. A long chain from the shelf above it held a shining copper kettle. How it boiled and bubbled, making its bright little lid dance merrily. That is hodgepodge for our supper, said Bradford, peeping, peeping into the kettle. What is hodgepodge? I hope it tastes good. Here's a picture. I'll show it to you. This is a picture of um, when they stepped into their that kitchen, and it shows him at the stove with uh, lifting the lid, looking at that funny mixture of food. We're gonna find out what hodgepodge is. Okay. I hope it tastes as good as it smells. Ooh, so that was a good. Indeed it does, Jonathan. It is the best stew of meat and vegetables you ever tasted. Our neighbor, Mevro Van Zant, taught me how to make it. Here are some little seed cakes she gave me for you children. One Dutch our Dutch neighbors are very kind. They have done much to help make, a, make the homes ready for our friends. When bedtime came, Mistress Brewster took fear and patience upstairs to their little room. In the corner was a large bed quite hidden behind long curtains which reached from ceiling to floor. When Patience pulled back the curtains and saw the high feather bed, she thought she would need a little ladder to get into it. I'll show you the picture in a second. As their mother tucked the children in and kissed them goodnight, Patience whispered, isn't this just like a dream? I fear when I wake and in the morning, this strange little house will be gone. The windmills and canals, the boats, the storks and the dikes will all be gone and we shall all be in England again. Here's the picture of her, the little bed that they had to pull back the curtains to and get into. All right, here's the next little part. It says in 1609, tea was first sipped shipped to Europe by the Dutch East India Company. Mm. So, they'd had tea before, but this was the first time that it was shipped by the Dutch East India Company. Or maybe they didn't have tea before. I will have to look that up. I'm not sure about that. Okay, I'm gonna keep reading. On the Canal. Next morning, the pretty blue and white dishes washed, the kettle scoured, and fresh white and sprinkled, and fresh white sand sprinkled on the kitchen floor. Patience took baby love and went out on the doorstep to watch the boats on the canal. I wonder why they sprinkled white sand on their floor. Hmm, maybe to fill in the places where the tiles meet. And we put grout in between to hold the um, tiles to make the tiles level. They're held in place by glue, but I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so they're sitting on the porch, basically watching the boats on the canal. There were many of these boats passing to and fro. Some carried fuel or grain, some carried fish, and others were loaded with boxes of goods from the mills. Some were passenger boats and carried people from one town to another. Soon Jonathan came out with a large stone jar which he set he set upon the wall of the canal. On the next doorstep sat Mary and remember Allerton, and they too had a large jar. There was one at Mistress Chilton's door, and all up and down the street might be seen these brown jars. Hmm. What were they for? Water, to be sure. These children were waiting for the water barge to come along and fill their jars. This seems strange in a land where there is more water than anything else. But the water in the canals is not fit to drink, so the people must buy fresh water every day. This is brought from the river far beyond the city. While the children waited for the water barge, they saw a large boat coming down the canal. There was no wind, so the sail was down. At first, they could not see what made it glide along so easily. As it came nearer, they saw that there was a long rope tied to the bow. Remember what the bow is, it's the front of the boat. 
and the boat was being drawn by a large dog and a boy who walked along the bank of the canal. So a boy and a dog were pulling that boat down the canal because he was walking he was walking on the side of the canal and the boat was floating in the river, basically, or the canal, and he was walking, pulling that boat. Wow. <clears throat> when the boat was in front of Elder Brewster's house, it stopped. The father came ashore and tied his boat to a strong post and then went back to his breakfast. This was not served in the neat little cabin with the white curtains at the windows. The breakfast table was spread on the deck of the boat. There was no cloth, but the table was scoured as white as Katrina's strong little arms could make it. While Katrina and her mother were washing the dishes, the water barge was seen coming slowly down the canal, stopping at each house. The mother saw the large barge and calling her son said something to him which the little pilgrims could not understand because it was in <clears throat> their language. Dutch, but Jan understood. He took up a large shining can and came over where Jonathan and Patience were. Good morning, said Jonathan. Are you waiting for the water barge too? But Jan only smiled and said nothing. He had not understood one word. When Mevro Vedder came up from her little, flat little boat with its rows of shining brass water cans, Jan talked fast enough. He seemed to know Med Mevro Vedder and Carl and Hans, who had come with their mother to help steer the boat. How fast they all talked and how strange the language, sounds, the language sounded to the English children. The Dutch language was so different from their own, the little pilgrims thought they could never learn to speak or understand this strange tongue. But they did, and Jan and Katrina were their first teachers. <clears throat> Uh, after a few days, when Jan called in Dutch, can you come up on the boat to play? The English children would answer yes or no in his language. They soon learned, learned the Dutch names for the games they played, for the different parts of the boat, and for many things in their own homes. Little by little, they grew to understand what their neighbors said to them. The children learned the language much easier than their parents did. Because it's easier for kids to learn things than adults. Your minds are just so, they're like sponges. And you just suck up knowledge. You're so smart. Jan and Katrina lived on the canal boat winter and summer. They had no other home. And they did not wish for one. They thought a canal boat was much better than a house. Which must always stay in one place. Many families lived in their boats all of the year. In winter, they had to live in the little cabin, but in the summer, but in summer, the kitchen, dining, and sitting room were all on the deck. All Hollanders are fond of flowers, and you are sure to see them somewhere about each home. Of course, Katrina had her little flower garden. It was in one corner of the deck, and her mother had a long box of plants in the cabin window. All fall and winter, this canal boat stayed in the same place. While their father worked in the mill, Jan and Katrina went to school. Katrina often knitted as she walked to and from school. Okay, take a look. Here's a picture of um, their little boat, Jan and Katrina. And um, you can see them on the top, up on the deck. And the kids or the people with the, the yeah, see the water pitchers? It's hard for me to see it looking backwards in the video. Okay, let's keep going a little bit more. Like I said, this is kind of a long one. <clears throat> little Dutch girls often knit on the street. They can knit and walk as easily they can t as they can talk and walk. Wow. Okay, I'm going to read a little excerpt from you. One of the most unusual painters of the 16th century, El Greco, the Greek, is known for his unique blending of Byzantine style with Venetian influences. Born in Crete, that is in the Mediterranean Sea, he began seriously painting in Venice where Titian became his mentor. I'm just reading this. If you understand it, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. <clears throat> Those are some famous, Titian was a famous artist. And uh, Venice is also another city that has canals for streets instead of streets. <clears throat> he, 
He lived for a time in Rome where he was influenced by the work of Michelangelo or Michelangelo, but did not appreciate his paintings. At one point, he even suggested that he would be willing to paint something better over Michelangelo's last judgment in the Sistine Chapel. After settling in Toledo, Spain, El Greco received many commissions, and between 1597 and 1607, he painted numerous works reflecting the religious fervor of the Spanish Counter-Reformation period. Wow, I'm sorry, actually, I read all that because it doesn't pertain to our story right now. Maybe for a little older student. <clears throat> I don't know if I can splice this video or not, but I'll see if I can. The Weekly Scrubbing Day, it's the next chapter. <clears throat> Early one morning, soon after the pilgrims came to Holland, they heard strange sounds in the street. Such a splashing and dashing of water. Swish, swish, trickle, trickle. Scrub, scrub. Could it be the dike was leaking? Mary Children ran to the door to see what was the matter. There she saw Mevro Van Zant and her daughter with jars and pails and kettles of water. With her strong white arms, the girl dashed the water upon the sides of the house. With long-handled brushes, she and her mother scrubbed the windows and walls. Then Hilda dashed on more water and they scrubbed again. Splash, dash, swish, drip. How the windows shine. Just find a spot of dust on that house if you can. Then out came more pails and kettles of water and more plump Hollanders in their white caps, short skirts and wooden shoes all up and down the street on both sides of the canal. It was splash, dash, swish, drip. Even the canal boats were having a wonderful scrubbing, both inside and out. Their brass trimmings were polished like gold. While Mary Children looked on with wonder in her round eyes, her father came out of the house. Why so sober, little one, he asked. I think they will not dash water over you. I was wondering if our houses are the only ones on the street left dirty, or if we had the only clean ones before. I do not see any dust. Oh, that makes no difference, laughed her father. On scrubbing day, Holland scrubs. It comes so often, things never have time to get very dusty. And here's a little picture. It says, on scrubbing day, Holland scrubs. Maybe we need a scrubbing day. I think I need one. Okay. Actually, that's the end of this video. And um, I'll upload it. And it'll be ready for tomorrow. And then I'll read another one. For Friday and I'll maybe I'll read two little chapters for it uh, or maybe I'll go ahead and read another one for part two for today I want us to try to get through um, pilgrim stories before we stop doing work this year okay bye <laughs>